this is this is amazing. I mean, this, this space is absolutely incredible. You should you use the word proud in your introduction earlier. You should be in your whole team you so incredibly proud of, of what you're doing. This is just absolutely incredible. President Farrell, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's such a an honor to be with such a great group of people. I think we're good. Yes, great. We got the slides working. That's important too. Um, Mr. Chairman, to, to you and the entire board of trustees here at the Clay College, your leadership has just been incredible. So I'm just absolutely honored to be with all of you tonight talking about the future of manufacturing here in Northwoods. This is an area that's really, really important to me. Uh, as, as Jeff knows, my, my, my wife's parents live 30 minutes from campus. Uh, you're wrong, they're not tourists, they live here. We spend tons and tons of time here. I love this part of our state, and I love what you've done here at the Clay College. So we're going to talk tonight about how important this whole world of manufacturing is. And President Farrell referenced a little bit of this in her introduction tonight. This is a gentleman by the name of Kurt Bauer, who's up here on the screen. Kurt is the head, he's the chairman and CEO of Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce. He was on my podcast last year talking about the importance of manufacturing. And he said that manufacturing is the number one contributor to our economy here in the state of Wisconsin. Number one, President Farrell just talked about the fact that we have $65 billion in annual GDP here in the state of Wisconsin that comes from the world of manufacturing. A half a million of our citizens, half a million people here in Wisconsin work in the field of manufacturing and 8,000 different manufacturing companies in our state. 8,000 manufacturing companies, you're right. Um, President Farrell, one in six members of our workforce owe their careers to the world of manufacturing here in the state of Wisconsin. One in six of your neighbors, one in six of the people that live in your township, in your village, your city, wherever it is that you live, one in six owe their way of life and owe their living to the world of manufacturing. And by the way, those people, as President Farrell suggested, make really good money, more than $75,000 a year on average working in manufacturing, and believe it or not, that is 50% more. 50% more than the average in our state. So folks working in the world of manufacturing make 50% more money than people on average here in the state of Wisconsin. But it's not just the impact that manufacturing has on the people working in manufacturing. It's the impact that it has on all of us. So we have what we call backward linkages. The fact is that manufacturers do things like purchase equipment and they purchase software. They do things like purchase motor vehicles. They insure their companies. They insure the people that work there. They buy materials like glass and plastic and steel. And they handle waste and pay people to do that in the contract services. So it's not just the folks working in manufacturing, but all of us that benefit from the fact that manufacturers are active in the economy. Then we have what we call forward linkages. So these are the folks that benefit from those people that work in manufacturing, they yes, spend $75,000 a year that they make in manufacturing on something. So they spend it on their cars, and they spend it on their houses, and their condominiums, and their apartments, and they spend it on utilities, and food, and entertainment. And know the fact that I'm here in northern Wisconsin and the Northwoods is not lost on me. They also spend on things like snowmobiles and boats and docks and fish tackle, ATVs, luxury pole barns. The pole barns are hard. Yeah. There's nothing like a pole barn in northern Wisconsin. Hunting rifles, tax derby, all of these things exist in so many ways because of the world of manufacturing. It's incredibly important to our economy. For every 100 people employed in the world of manufacturing, there are another 500 to 700 jobs that exist as a result of those folks working in manufacturing. So this isn't just something I like to get up and talk about. I actually do like to get up and talk about it, but not, it's not just that. I spent my entire career up until about five years ago as a CEO and the chief operating officer of manufacturing companies. So I have seen firsthand the way that manufacturing changes lives. One of my favorite stories is a young man named Joe Dyer who came to one of our companies and he was started out sweeping the floor. Started out sweeping the floor in that company. He was a material handler, pretty basic manufacturing work. Today he is a director of manufacturing at three manufacturing plants. Running three plants, lives in a small town called Blue Hall State, Wisconsin, makes amazing money, you know, well into the six figures, and is doing probably well. Got to start 
in manufacturing, got to start sweeping the floors, and got a huge leap when he went to his local community college to learn about how we can be more effective in that employer, the company that we own. Joe is just one example of so many people that I have seen whose lives have been fundamentally changed by careers in manufacturing. It's still that one place where you can start out sweeping the floor and end up running the company or cause anywhere on the way and have an amazing, life supporting, family supporting, sustainable career in the world of manufacturing. And thanks to places like Nicolay College, by the way, you don't have to start out sweeping the floor. You can learn from people like Steve and Dan and Warren and John and others all this cool advanced manufacturing stuff and get an amazing head start. An amazing head start when you get to the world of manufacturing. But the truth is, as you can see from the technology in this room and in this building, the world of manufacturing continues to change and it continues to evolve. The world of technology is evolving. So right now, today, every single minute, we share 65,000 photos on Instagram. 240,000 photos every single minute on Facebook. We tweet 575,000 times every single minute. We watch 167 million TikTok videos every minute. And if you haven't started watching TikTok, I advise you not to because you will not be able to stop. And I have little proof of that. 5.7 million Google searches every single minute. 12 million instant messages. 280 clubhouse rooms are open every single, every single 60 seconds. If you're not familiar with clubhouse, you will be. That thing is growing like crazy. 2 million Snapchats, 390,000 apps are downloaded, 100 people, 100,000 people connect on Teams, Microsoft Teams every minute, 452,000 hours of Netflix, 694,000 hours of YouTube videos that are watched every minute, 6 million people shop online every single minute. And they spend $67,000 a minute on Instacart, 283,000 hours a minute on Amazon, and we spend, we send three hundred four thousand dollars every single minute on Venmo. In the sixty seconds it took me to read off that slide, all of that happened on the internet. We live in an amazing time of technology, and it's not just the world of technology; it is the world of manufacturing, and that is what is driving what we call the fourth industrial revolution. A little bit of a history lesson, if you're not familiar with that, we had the first industrial revolution back in the seventeen hundreds where things like mechanization and steam power totally changed the way that we manufacture products here in the United States and around the globe. Turning the plot forward to the late 1800s, we had the second industrial revolution. This is electricity, this is mass production. They can be Ford's mass production, moving production line. Totally revolutionized manufacturing. Happened again in the late 1970s, early 1980s, where we started using robotics and we started using computers to manufacture products. And the whole idea of Industry 4.0 is that we are now well into the Ford Industrial Revolution, where technologies like interconnectivity and predictive analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning and cyber physical systems are totally changing the world of manufacturing. That's why investments like this one are so important, is that we have to make sure that our students are learning and cutting edge technology and well they are. At the core of this whole idea of Industry 4.0, is the smart sensor or the smart device. Everybody walked in this room, walked in here with a smart device tonight. What is it? Smartphone. Yep, smartphone, exactly. Right here in the, in the front of the room. It's your smartphone. Every one of us has a smart device. Now, in manufacturing, we are using smart, smart, smart sensors and smart devices as well to do all kinds of stuff. These are all the different things that we use smart technology to read in manufacturing. And we're using the smart technology to monitor our systems and then help us make decisions. So there's two things that make smart sensors and devices smart. The first one is that they have the ability to communicate with each other. And the second one is that they have embedded intelligence. They can make decisions on their own. Smart devices live on the edge. So when you hear people talk about edge networks or edge technology, edge devices, that's what they're talking about. Not to be confused with the cloud, which are the programmable logic controllers, like the creators that we have right next door, or to be confused with the networks that we use in manufacturing. And also not to be confused with the data centers. This is the cloud where all this data is measured and analyzed. So here's why this is really, really important. In the years of Industry 3.0, before these centers were smart, they had to communicate all the time with something, all the time with a programmable logic controller or a computer. Network. But now what has happened is that we have made these things smart. So in the past, the challenge was the time that it took to send information all over a manufacturing plant. 
and the bandwidth that was required in order to do that limited the number of sentences that we could deploy. All of that is changing now. Once these can communicate with each other, once they can make their own decisions, the need to necessarily communicate with a PLC all the time starts to go away. And so do those constraints of time and bandwidth. So here's what this means. About a year and a half, two years ago, I was at the lobby of Marco Automation in Milwaukee, and he knows this guy named John Carey, who's with the Sloan School at MIT, expert in smart manufacturing technology. And here's what he said. He said this, the cost of these things, of these smart sensors and devices, are decreasing by orders of magnitude. That means that something that used to cost us $10,000 is now $1,000. And something that was $1,000 is now $100. He said the size of them is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so, as a result of that, we can deploy them in more places. And he said the cost to implement the solution to plug in devices into the NIoT platform and utilize it is now less than $100. And this is totally transforming the world of manufacturing. About a year ago, maybe two years ago, I was sitting at my desk and I had a call from my friend Mark Mooney. Mark is the chancellor at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And he said, Matt, I'm having a cocktail party for Brad Smith. Do you want to join me? And I said, cocktails? Yeah, I'd love to join you. Who's Brad Smith? <laughs> Turns out Brad Smith is the president of Microsoft. And here's what Brad said when we talked about. He said, by the year 2025, 75 billion devices will be connected to the internet. He said it is a $2.7 trillion market. I think that's a market that Brad Smith and Microsoft are spending Time thinking about these devices are totally transforming everything, including manufacturing. And they are bringing with them the advent of what we call digital twins in manufacturing. So, in my manufacturing years, my last manufacturing company that we sold out about five or six years ago, we were a huge supplier to Harley Davidson. Did a ton of work with the Harley plant in Tomahawk, not too far from here, and the one in New York, and the one in Kansas City, and the ones in Milwaukee. And so, I saw this display, and it was a paint robot. Very, very similar, by the way, to the robots that Steve is teaching on right next door. A paint robot painting Harley's buildings. And I was fascinated by that display. The engineer that put that together came up to me and he said, Oh, you think that's cool? He said, Let me take you across the hall. And we walked across the hall, and he took me to this room full of computers, and on it was a full digital twin of that process. A digital twin is an exact digital replica of a manufacturer or another process, in the case of manufacturing. Process. And so now we have a complete, perfectly accurate digital twin of a physical process. And here is why that is important in the world of manufacturing. You see, in my world of manufacturing, in my days of industry 3.0, if we wanted to improve a process, we had to figure out what we wanted to do, then go out onto the shop floor and make the change on the shop floor. And I can tell you that was the scariest day in the life of any industrial engineer when you're changing that manufacturing process and you don't know if it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, you're the one that makes, you're the reason that the parts didn't get up the floor that day. Well, now what happens when we take these and we load them up with those smart sensors and smart devices that we just talked about, and we connect them to a digital twin and allow that digital twin to get smarter and smarter and smarter over time. And now when we want to improve the process, we don't go to the floor and improve the process and take the risk of shutting down the plant. We go to the digital twin and we practice there, and we figure out our solution there, and only when it's working perfectly do we take it to the floor. This is going to exponentially increase the speed at which we can innovate in manufacturing. This is really, really important technology. And it's being driven in so many ways by our access to data. Now, some of you have heard the story about the woman who lives in this house, and there's a squeak in the kitchen floor. And every time somebody walks across the floor, it makes the squeak. If somebody's sleeping in the room next door and they walk across the floor and the squeak happens, it's loud enough to wake them up. And she finally breaks down and she calls the local carpenter and brings him in and says, I need to fix the squeak in my floor. And the carpenter walks across the floor a couple times and listens to the squeak. And he looks down and he takes a nail and he puts it in exactly the right spot on the floor. And he pounds the nail and then he stands up. And he walks across the floor and there's no squeak and he invites the woman to walk across the floor and there's no squeak and she says, oh, thank you, thank you. I can't tell you how much better this is going to make my life that that floor won't be squeaking all the time. And he said, you're welcome. And he pulled a piece of paper out of his pocket and he wrote on that piece of paper and said, invoice across the top. And he said, fix squeaky floor 
75 hours, a total of 75 hours of candidate employment. And the woman looks at it and she says, 75 hours? 75 hours? I mean, I really appreciate what you did, but isn't that a lot for me to just pound the mail? So you know what, you're right, they took that piece of paper back and crumpled it up and they put it back in his pocket and they took out another one and he wrote an invoice. And then on that piece of paper he said, pound one nail, one dollar. Knowing where to pound the nail, $74 for a total of $75 and he gave it back to the woman. Now the truth is that in this world of Industry 4.0, it's a lot different than what it used to do and what it used to be and that's why places like this here at Detroit College are so important is that in my days of Industry we got paid for what we could do. If we could bend metal, if we could weld, we got paid for that. If we could fix a mechanical drive, we could pay for that. We get paid for what we did. And then we evolved into a time where we got paid for what we knew. Where the more knowledge that we had, the better we got paid. And now we're evolving into an era where it's not just important enough to have that knowledge, but it's important to understand how we apply it and use it to solve problems. And that's what's happening here. When you see what, what the instructors do here, I teach them things like troubleshooting, quickly finding a problem in a process. I used to joke in my manufacturing processes and my manufacturing plants that troubleshooting was replacing parts on the line until it started working again. That is not a troubleshooting. Troubleshooting is finding that exact problem, solving a problem and applying what you know. That's why what happens here is so important and we're living in this era of incredible amounts of data. Most companies only analyze 12% the data that they have available to them, believe it or not. The amount of data created in the financial industry grew by 700% last year. Big data analytics market is set to reach $103 billion by next year. If you're a Netflix subscriber, Netflix says that they save a billion dollars a year in lost customers using artificial intelligence and data, figuring out what you watch, when you watch it, when you like to watch it, and serving up exactly the right material for you at exactly the time you want to see it. A billion dollars a year in revenue doing that. And the amount of data created over the last, over the next three years, will be more than what's been created over the last 30 years combined. We are swimming in tremendous amounts of data, which is driving one of the last things we'll talk about in Industry 4.0. This whole world of artificial intelligence and how we're using artificial intelligence in the world of manufacturing. Now, the CEO of Google said this he said that artificial intelligence is probably the most important thing that humanity has ever worked on. He said it will be more profound, think about this, more profound than electricity or fire. Two total game changers in terms of the history of what it means to be a human. So here's an example. You see here on the left is a little, a little circle that is trying to take that, that little pendulum and stand it straight up. And we don't teach that servo how to stand it straight up and give it rewards using artificial intelligence as it gets closer and closer to what we want. And it figures out on its own using artificial intelligence and machine learning how to stand that pendulum on the straight. And as you can see over time, it figures out how to do it. We didn't program it to do it. It figured that out on its own by us telling us the result that it wanted. Really, really cool example of artificial intelligence. Here's another one. This is a project that we worked on with the Oakland schools and, and a few universities in Southeast Michigan. On the left hand side, what you see is somebody driving an RC car, just driving a remote control car that's loaded up with LiDAR and sensors and artificial intelligence and an Arduino. And it's communicating with the car and somebody's driving that. On the right hand side, you see the car driving itself, not because we taught it how to drive itself, but because it used artificial intelligence and machine learning to figure out how to drive. Itself. And these aspects of machine learning and artificial intelligence are changing so many different aspects of our economy. Now, I've got a friend named Chris Trees. Chris is the president of Mercury Marine. You see a lot of Mercury Marine engines up here in the Northwoods. I had him on my podcast last year. Chris said using artificial intelligence and machine learning, within five years, they are going to have boats that can park themselves on the dock without a human being. Now, I'm a big sailor. I spent about a year living on a sailboat. I've seen a lot of people crash boats into docks. I had a lot of my neighbors that did that. I spent time up here over the holidays. I don't want to be anywhere near a bunch of the North Woods on Memorial Day or on the 4th of July. I've seen so many people you know, slam their boats into the dock trying to get them on the trailer. I can tell you that that technology is going to be really, really popular. If we can have a boat that can put itself right on the trailer and tie itself right up to a dock. But it's not just boats and it's not just our cars, it's also manufacturing. 
So would you believe today that right now, right now General Motors has 15,000 robots that they have deployed for manufacturing operations? 15,000 robots that they have loaded up with those same smart sensors and smart devices that we just talked about. By the way, it's not a coincidence that these robots on the slide are just like the ones next door because more students are learning on the same robots that General Motors uses across its entire operation to manufacture our product. Loaded up with smart sensors and smart devices that are gathering data on things like torque and temperature and disturbances and force and humidity and moisture and sending all that information to a computer network and then to a data collector and then up to the cloud where an analytic is to the point where those robots will predict their own future failure and order their own replacement parts before the failure ever happens. If that's not manufacturing in 20 years, 10 years, or 5 years, that is manufacturing today. And the robots here at Deploy College can do that themselves, have the technology on them to do that themselves, believe it or not. Absolutely amazing technology. And by the way, that's not true just for robots, but it's true of all of our fabrication equipment, cut presses, and curry presses, and press breaks, of our machining equipment, of our casting equipment, of our, um, our welding equipment, every single aspect of our manufacturing equipment has embedded smart technology that will do that, well, that will predict its own future failure or its own replacement costs. That's why what is happening here tonight is so important, and it leads to amazing career opportunities. This was a study that was done by Manpower not too long ago. They issued this white paper. When you see the word specialist, when you see the word engineer, when you see the word manager, those are not necessarily four-year degrees. There are tons and tons of people that are earning tech diplomas and associate degrees places just like the Philly College and going on to amazing careers in advanced manufacturing. That is where the future of manufacturing is going to look like. Would you believe that automation technician, automation engineer, the same careers we're preparing students for here? That is the fourth happiest job in America, according to USA Today. Fourth happiest job in America. How many people even know, especially our young people, even know that that is a job that they can have? And so as we close our time tonight, I'm going to tell you about one young man who knows that that's a job that he could have. Now this is our son Noah. He's off doing some other things now. When he graduated from high school, I insisted that he work in the world of manufacturing. I insisted that he work in a manufacturing plant and he did that for the whole first summer he was out of school and for a good portion of his first year afterwards. And I would have people tell me and they would kind of laugh and they'd say, I know why you want your son to work in manufacturing. You want him to know the value of staying in school. And I said, you know, never mind, and I think to myself, never mind how offensive that is to somebody who made their career in manufacturing for 25 years. That wasn't the reason at all. I wanted my son to know the dignity of working in manufacturing. I wanted him to know what it's like to work for a day and be able to look over your shoulder at the end of the day at a pile of parts on, on the dock or on the truck or in a container and be able to say, I made it. I wanted him to be able to know the amazing people that work on the plant floors across the United States. They're good people. There are hardworking people, there are hardworking people, there are great Americans. And I want him to have exposure to those kind of folks. That is why I want my son to work in, in manufacturing. Now, this is Nick Pinchuk. Nick is the CEO and chairman and CEO of Snap on, had him on the Tech Ed podcast last year as well. These people that work in our plants, these are the people that he calls the heroes of our time. Manufacturing people are the heroes of our time. People working in these careers are the heroes of our time. So I know when we're here at Nicolay College, we think we educate students, and we certainly do that. And we think we inspire them for amazing careers, and we certainly do that. And we think we give them life skills, and we certainly do that. But at the same time, you here are creating the heroes of our time. I want to thank you for that work. I want you to be proud of what you're doing, and I want you to know that I was proud to be a part of this amazing event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you. All right. Well, once again, I just want to say thank you to everybody for sharing time with us. And um, couldn't be happier, couldn't be prouder. Um, and it took, like I said, it took a great group of people to make this happen. And uh, enjoy the rest of the night. Stick around. Um, there's beverages. There's probably some food left. And uh, collaborate. So, thank you.